Thank you, Elliot, Christy, and Rhonda. That was beautiful. Oh, I'm excited about sharing a message with you about fathers and uh, the heart of a, of a great father. And, um, you know, it was kind of, I thought it was kind of ironic that um, Josh was teaching on Mother's Day and I'm teaching on Father's Day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, God always works things out the way they should be. And um, I'm excited because, you know, uh, my father passed away in 1981. He went to be with the Lord then. And, um, and my, my mom, it, we didn't move even here to this area until 1983. So people in this area that are all my dearest, dearest friends, they never had an opportunity to meet my father. And, and, but my mom was, lived with us, and she was an integral part of this church, so many people know, know my, knew my mom, and, um, and I've shared a lot about mom, because they know, you know, you know who I'm talking about, but I haven't shared a lot, I realized that as I was talking to Tim and Jackie about the message today, I haven't shared a lot with you about my dad. And uh, my dad was just um, an amazing guy. Uh, I realized as I'm older how amazing he was, and um, I had the for good fortune and the blessing of having just a really good dad, and um, he, he meant a lot in my life, and I know that we live in a society and a, a place in our history right now where um, there's, there's a lot of families that either don't have a father in the picture or they, the father that's in the picture has not really acted like a father. And um, so it's, you know, I especially know how blessed I am when I hear from other people their experiences with their dads. But um, I just want to share a little bit about him. Um, first of all, I was, the, I was the baby baby of the family when I was the, oh my gosh, we're pregnant baby, uh, because my two brothers were 14 and 17 when I was conceived. <laughs> And, and so that was a real shocker to my parents uh, that, you know, at this age, they were going to have another child. Um, and so my dad is of a, another generation several back because he was born in 1899. And uh, so, you know, he always talked about all of the things that he saw over his, over his lifetime. And, um, you know, I, I, I wrote a blog this week a little bit about him, and one of the things I said in there is I remember him sitting and watching as a man was walking on the moon. And he was like, you know, he came from horse and buggy days. There weren't even automobiles. And yet here he was watching a person walk on the moon. So, um, you know, it, you can just imagine the things that he saw. And it was kind of fun to have a dad that was sharing those kind of memories with you. You know, there were a lot of outhouse stories, I'll tell you that. And uh, <laughs> we miss a lot not having outhouses. They are great stories that come around those. But... <laughs> but it was it was really a lot of fun well uh, my parents were also very entrepreneurial they they were they had a pioneer spirit there's only there's only, only way to put it you know um, so uh, during one of the things they always talked about is during the great depression uh, they felt very blessed that they had jobs um, my dad worked on the Great Northern Railroad, and he maintained refrigeration cars, and he had a job all the way through the Depression. And my mom, they lived in Wenatchee. Uh, both my bro brothers were born there. They lived in Wenatchee, and mom uh, picked cherries and apples, and uh, she would work in the processing plant um, processing the apples and cherries. So, so that was her job that she had. And I, all of us kids always heard about how fortunate our family was because they did have these jobs. And, um, but they decided um, in talking that things were better in California. And so um, they packed up 
they packed up uh, their little rattly automobile <laughs> and their two sons and whatever earthly goods they could put into this automobile and they headed for California. No job, just headed down there. Landed in Sacramento and my dad got a job there as an auto mechanic. He was very good. He was he he had an engineering kind of brain and he would have been a very good engineer had he been educated. He only had through a sixth grade education. And um, but he he was very mechanical. And um, so he could tune a car to just purr. And so that was my dad. Well, as he's working as an auto mechanic, he really does, didn't like working for other people. He wanted to be, you know, he came from farming background. He wanted to be a farmer. So he had a guy that he was working with says, Earl, you need to go into poultry. And, and dad's like, poultry? Why do I need to go into poultry? I don't even like chicken. And, and you know, and, and he says, no, there's going to be big money in poultry. And so you need to get into poultry. So this guy talked dad into going into poultry, a man who didn't even like chicken. And uh, so mom and dad had saved up a little bit of money. They bought 15 acres in Citrus Heights, California. And um, they, dad built himself the chicken coops and the, everything like that. He learned from the poultry producers that the best place to get, there is a Poultry Producers of America, by the way. And uh, he learned from his association with them that the best place to buy your chickens was at University of California, Davis. One of the biggest poultry um, divisions in the whole university complex is UC Davis Poultry. Uh, now, see, you know, you learned something here today. In case you ever need to buy poultry. And um, so he bought baby chicks and raised them up. And he started with fryers, but since he hated chicken, but he did like eggs. Um, and he was not a man who liked killing things. So he decided that he was moving over to laying hens. So he, at the peak of our farm, we had 2,000 laying hens. And we did all of the work ourselves, my, my brothers, and when I, after I was born, I was part of the, of the work crew. And um, so that was how I grew up. I grew up around 2,000 chickens and all the things that goes with that. And um, in Citrus Heights, California. Well, Dad was just an amazing father. And, and I want to tell a story about my dad that tells you what kind of dad he was. Um, when I was a little girl, I was always up to something. And I still am. Uh, <laughs> but I remember one Saturday, we went to the Roseville Market, the Farmer's Market in Roseville, California. And um, they had an auction and all this stuff. It was always the big deal on Saturday. And mom and dad bought me a pair of red Ked tennis shoes. My very first pair. Um, I loved those shoes. They were so pretty. I, you know, I, mom couldn't get them off my feet. I everywhere, you know, to church, I had to wear red, my red Ked tennis shoes, whatever. So I'm wearing these tennis shoes, and I'm down in the pasture. Now, farmers sell everything. You know that, don't you? They sell everything they can to, to make a living. Uh, it's not just the eggs, you know. We also had, we also sold the manure. And so in our pasture was a huge pile of manure. And, and people would come in because they would need this manure for their gardens or whatever. They would come in with their pickup trucks and they would shovel in a manure and pay dad, you know, 20 bucks for a load of manure and off they'd go. Well, when you have 2,000 chickens, cattle, and horses, there's a lot of manure. <laughs> and so in the west end of our pasture was a big mountain. And who knows why, but I got it in my head that I wanted to conquer that mountain of manure. 
in my brand new red CAD tennis shoes. Now, I, I hate to be gross, but you know, sitting out in the sun in California, manure forms a crust on the top. And so it seems that you can walk on it without any problem. But like anything else, if you understand physics, the, the deeper you are in you know what, um, the crust is less likely to hold your weight, right? So as you're walking in the, in the thinner parts, the crust is pretty good. But when you get to the deeper parts, um, I learned that the crust gives way. And suddenly I found myself, I'm, I, I'm about six or seven years old, something like that. I find myself up to my thigh in manure. And I can't, it, it, suck, it suctioned me down and I couldn't get out. It was like quicksand. And I'm like, help, help, help. <laughs> and my dad comes down and I will never forget the look on his face. I can't even, but, but he's just like, what were you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I'm just I'm walking on the manure. And, just, you know. and so dad goes, gets a shovel, and he come wading out of the manure. And of course, he's a little heavier than I was, so he was sinking before I did. He walks out there, and he takes that shovel, and he puts it underneath me, and he lifts me out of the manure. Well, there's a really good suction, so guess what happened? To my red cat tennis shoes. Right off my feet. So dad gets me out onto the ground, and I, I'm just like, my tennis shoes, my tennis shoes. And the tears are just streaming down my face. And dad looks at me, and he just kind of shakes his head, and he walks back out. And he reaches down with his hands into that manure, and he pulls out my red CAD tennis shoes. And I, that's a time in a little girl when dad becomes a superhero. <laughs> you know your dad loves you when he will wade in chicken manure <laughs> and pull out your red CAD tennis shoes. And he brings it back to me, and he, he, he said, he looks at me, and he goes, why did you do that? And I go, oh, I don't know, I forgot to tennis shoes. And he goes, okay, honey, and he gives me a hug, and he says, just go get cleaned up. <laughs> and that was the last, other than later on, of course, the story regaled and regaled over in our family around the dinner table after dessert. <laughs> but that's the kind of dad I had. That was the kind of dad, and it's the kind of dad that I know many people dream that's what a dad should do, right? That's the kind of dad that he would sacrifice his dignity <laughs> to go dig your tennis shoes out of the manure, even though you got in that position on your own <laughs> stupidity. And so I was reading Psalm 103, and that whole story of my dad came back to me because Psalm 103 talks about, King David talks about our wonderful heavenly father and how great he is. And, and it, as I read that, I went, you know, I know my dad wasn't perfect. He had all his, you know, all the foibles and imperfections that a human being has. But he was sure a great dad. And it reminded me that he was, our Heavenly Father is even a greater dad. And that oftentimes, so often, I hear of people who don't have fathers like I had. And when I hear about that, you know, when I hear the statistic that 40% of the children in the United States of America grow up in a family where there is no father present. That's really a hard statistic, isn't it? 
And, and there's even a high percentage of those where there's no father present, that the father not only is not present in the household, but they're not present in the children's lives at all. They have just disappeared. And so, you know, it, everything I'm reading is our country is right now suffering from a fatherless crisis. And, and you think about that, and it just hurts my heart because I know how much my dad influenced my life and how much he, how much he means to me. And those stories and those incidents, you know, they, they have molded who I am. And when you don't have that, what a piece you are missing. You know, whether it's because you don't have a father in your life or because the father in your life was not like that. And so um, years ago, it, it, to me, it gives a special challenge to a church. Years ago, I remember a, a lady coming to our church. Um, this is back when we were meeting Lake Washington High School. And one of the things she shared with me at that time is that she said, you know, I'm a single mom. I have this little girl. And her father doesn't want to have anything to do with us. And so he's not going to be a part of her life. And what I love about this church is there's a whole bunch of really great men here who are father figures to my daughter. And she even asked if she and her daughter could come to a couples TLC group that Rich and I led so that her daughter could be exposed to some really loving, caring men. And that's what the church is all about. That when there's, for some reason, life has taken something away from somebody, that we as a church, as a community, can give that back to them. We can be that, that, church, that place where you can find a father, you can find a grandfather, you can find an uncle, you can find a big brother. Someone who cares for you. And I look out at a sea of people I, that have been those people in children's lives here in the church. I see Mary Burke sitting there. Hi, Mary. It's so good to see you. Her husband, Howard, who's with the Lord, he was that person, wasn't he, Mary? He was a big brother to so many kids. I mean, he was a great dad to Raymond, <laughs> but he was a big brother to so many kids. And he would, he would find out that they needed to have something, and he would go get it for them, or he would take them someplace. And I could go around and tell you stories, stories, stories about so many of the guys here in the church. Isn't that what it's all about? And we have the perfect role model, our Heavenly Father, so I have like three minutes to go through Psalm 103. And um, learn from this, a father's love, a father's heart. So a father's heart is slow to anger. Verse 8 says, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. We have a heavenly father who shows and models to us amazing forgiveness. He has a short fuse. He doesn't get angry quickly. He, he puts up, I know when I, when I read about our Heavenly Father and I look at my life and the things that I have uh, done, like waiting out of manure piles, I think about my Heavenly Father has been so patient with me. And he models that to us. He looks for the best in his children. Verse 10, he does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the heights of heaven above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Our heavenly father looks for the best in us. 
And isn't that what a good earthly father does? He looks for the best in his kids. He looks at his kids covered in manure and says, I love you. I love you. And it's such a, a beautiful thing to know that you're loved despite their failings. He sees exactly who we are. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. He remembers we're just going to be messing up all the time. He remembers that we are his children despite the things that we do. I love that about our father, and I love that about my dad. He truly loves us to the moon and back. We have a heavenly father who loves us unconditionally. David says this, let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercy. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. God loves us so dearly. He's there for us at all times. So even if we don't have an earthly father or even an earthly father figure that we can applaud today, we have a heavenly father that we can applaud. You know, I've had so many people come to me and say, I cannot see God as my father because I do not like my father. And I, I always say, that's why it's so important that you see the kind of father that God is. Because he's the kind of father that he wanted you to have. He's the kind of father that would be important to be in your life. You can see that. God is that amazing father. We can learn from him. We can learn, we all, whether we're, we're fathers or mothers or sisters or brothers, we have something we can learn from God about how we treat one another, how we care for one another. I was reading a book on this that call, that's called Church for the Fatherless. And it's written by a pastor down in Portland, Oregon. And he's, he's looking at a church where he has so many children who don't have fathers in their homes. And... and um, this is what he is saying at the end of his book to all of the men. So, men, this is for you. But, ladies, we can learn from it, too. He says, today, you may long to be a better father to your children. Follow the example of your heavenly father. Be present with your children physically and emotionally. Find creative ways to let your children know that they are yours and that you wouldn't trade them for the world. Understand, yes, you are not perfect, but who is? Stop beating yourself up over your shortcomings. Rather, rely on your loving Father, your Father in heaven, to give you the grace you need to be the Father he wants you to be. He will help you be present acknowledging, loving, and affirming to your children. Today, your heart may be burdened for the many fatherless children living in your extended family, church, or community. Allow the father's heart to become your heart. Find a child to whom you can be a mentor. Become a big brother, a surrogate dad, or a grandpa. I found out that the Big Brother organization has a waiting list of kids that need Big Brothers that is, like, huge. There's just not enough guys to go around. Be there for them and share the heart of your Heavenly Father with them. Let them know how valuable they are and how much God and you love them. There's no need to try to be a pro. Just be present. Remember, your prayers make a difference in the lives of the fatherless, too. 
Let's pray. Let's pray that, that our Heavenly Father's great love for us can just well up inside of us, and it can go out into our world and into our community, and that we can heal the crisis that we have in our society today, that we can, as a church, make a huge difference in the lives of children. Let's, I'm going to say a quick prayer in a moment, and then we're going to close our service with the music team is going to lead a song, and we're going to ask you to bring your cards up and pin them on the board. And again, maybe it's a message to your earthly father, wherever he is, here or in heaven. Maybe it's a message to a father figure who's been in your life who's just been a blessing to you. Maybe it's a stepdad. Maybe it's a message to your heavenly father. Or maybe it's to all of those. But just take a moment and write that note that you would love to say to them and pin it up here on the board. And just remember, there was one guy that came up to me at the 930 service and he said, Pastor Linda, hearing about your dad is so great because I didn't have a father like that. And he says, I've come to believe that what I need to do is just look for the good in my dad, despite all the bad. And maybe that's what God is leading you to today. So we'll do that. At the close of the service, there'll be communion served up here at the front on either side. And we'll have um, Pastor Michael, I believe, in the prayer garden. Or is that right? Guys, I don't have the thing in front of me. <laughs> yes, here he comes. So he'll be in the prayer garden. He's going to actually help you with the pins up here too. And I'm just going to let this be the close of our service as we put our cards on the board. If you want to come back and sit and pray in your chair, that's great. If not, you can line up for communion or, or go on out. There's bratwurst out there. You got the hats Remember the brats? And uh, some good food that Pastor David has prepared. Go out and make a glorious day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you that you are such an awesome Father. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you have given us. And we thank you that you are a role model for all of us on how we should interact with one another and with our children. Lord, I especially pray for the dads. I just pray a blessing on their hearts right now, Lord, that they can just um, take these words and understand that they can just be present with the children around them. What a difference that makes in the lives of those children. Lord, we pray for those people who, in their hearts, they just have a hard time with the whole concept of Father because they've become so hurt. Lord, I pray that today can be a healing, that they can look at you, Heavenly Father, and realize the love that you have for them and that you are that Father. You are that Father that loves us. You have a short fuse. You know who we are, and you love us unconditionally. Be with us now, Lord. Go with us this week and help us to show your love to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.